Jaharis and Alisane, Their Triumphs and Tragedies The accomplishments of King Jaharis I Targaryen are almost too many to enumerate. Chief amongst them, in the view of most students of history, are long periods of peace and prosperity that marked his time upon the Iron Throne. It cannot be said Jaehaerys avoided conflict entirely, for that would be beyond the power of any earthly king. But such wars as he fought were short, victorious, and contested largely at sea or on distant soil. It is a poor king who wages battle against his own lords and leaves his own kingdom burned, bloody, and strewn with corpses. Septum Barth would write, his grace was a wiser man than that. Archmaesters can and do quibble about the numbers, but most agree that the population of Westeros north of Dorne doubled during the Conciliator's reign, whilst the population of King's Landing increased fourfold. Lannisport, Gulltown, Duskendale, and White Harbor grew as well, though not to the same extent. With fewer men marching off to war, more remained to work the land. Grain prices fell steadily throughout his reign as more acres came under the plow. Fish became notably cheaper, even for common men, as the fishing villages along the coast grew more prosperous and more boats put to sea. New orchards were planted everywhere from the reach to the neck. Lamb and mutton became more plentiful and wool finer as shepherds increased the size of their flocks. Trade increased tenfold, despite the vicissitudes of wind, weather, and wars, and the disruptions they caused from time to time. The crafts flourished as well. Farriers and blacksmiths, stonemasons, carpenters, millers, tanners, weavers, felters, dyers, brewers, vintners, goldsmiths, and silversmiths, bakers, butchers, and cheesemakers all enjoyed a prosperity hitherto unknown west of the Narrow Sea. There were, to be sure, good years and bad, but it was rightfully said that under Jaehaerys and his queen, the good years were twice as good as the bad years were bad. Storms there were, and ill winds, and bitter winters. But when men look back today upon the conciliator's reign, it is easy to mistake it for one long green and gentle summer. Little of this would be apparent to Jaehaerys himself as the bells of King's Landing rang to usher in the 55th year since Aegon's conquest. The wounds left by that cruel year, the year of the stranger, were as yet too raw, and king, queen, and council alike feared what might lie ahead. With the Princess Arya and Balerion still vanished from human ken, and Queen Reyna gone in search of them. Having taken leave of her brother's court, Reyna Targaryen flew to Old Town first, in the hopes that her wayward daughter might have sought out her twin sister. Lord Donal and the High Septum each received her courteously, but neither had any help to offer. The Queen was able to visit for a time with her daughter, Hralia, so like and yet so unlike her twin, and it can be hoped that she found some balm for her pain there. When Reyna expressed regret that she had not been a better mother, the novice Raelia embraced her and said, I have had the best mother any child could wish for, the mother above, and you are to thank for her. Departing Old Town, Dreamfire took the queen northward, first to Highgarden, then to Crack Hall and Casterly Rock, whose lords had welcomed her in days gone by. Nowhere had a dragon been seen, save for her own. Not even a whisper of Princess Arya had been heard. Thence, Reyna returned to Fair Isle, to face Lord Franklin Foreman once again. The years had not made his lordship any fonder of the Queen, nor any wiser in how he chose to speak to her. I had hoped my lady sister might come home to do her duty once she fled from you, Lord Franklin said. But we have had no word of her, nor of your daughter. I cannot claim to know the princess, but I would say she is well rid of you, as was Fair Isle. If she turns up here, we will see her off, just as we did her mother. You do not know Arya that much is true, her grace responded. If she does indeed find her way to these shores, my lord, you may find she is not as forbearing as her mother. Oh, and I wish you luck if you should try to see off the Black Dread. Balerion quite enjoyed your brother. By now, he may desire another course. After Fair Isle, history loses track of Reyna Targaryen. 
She would not return to King's Landing or Dragonstone for the rest of the year, nor present herself at the seat of any lord in the Seven Kingdoms. We have fragmentary reports of Dreamfire being seen as far north as the Barrowlands and the banks of the Fever River, and as far south as Red Mountains of Dorne and the canyons of Torrentine. Shunning castles and cities, Reyna and her dragon were glimpsed flying over the Fingers and the Mountains of the Moon, the misty green forests of Cape Wrath, the Shield Islands, and the Arbor, but nowhere did she seek out human company. Instead, she sought the wild, lonely places, windswept moors and grassy plains and dismal swamps, cliffs and crags and mountain glens. Was she still hunting for some sign of her daughter, or was it simply solitude she desired? We shall never know. Her long absence from King's Landing was for the good, however, for the king and his council were growing ever more vexed with her. The accounts of Reyna's confrontation with Lord Farman on Fair Isle had appalled the king and his lords alike. "'Is she mad to speak so to a lord in his own hall?' Lord Smallwood said. "'Had it been me, I would have had her tongue out.' To which the king replied, "'I hope you would not truly be so foolish, my lord. Whatever else she may be, Reyna remains the blood of the dragon and my sister, whom I love.' His grace did not take issue with Lord Smallwood's point, it should be noted, only with his words. Septim Barth said it best. The power of the Targaryens derives from their dragons, those fearsome beasts who once laid waste to Harrenhal and destroyed two kings upon the field of fire. King Jaehaerys knows this, just as his grandsire, Aegon, did. The power is always there, and with it, the threat. His grace also grasps a truth that Queen Rhaena does not. However, the threat is most effective when left unspoken. The lords of the realm are all proud men, and little is gained by shaming them. A wise king will always let them keep their dignity. Show them a dragon, aye, they will remember. Speak openly of burning down their halls, boast of how you fed their own kin to your dragons, and you will only inflame them and set their hearts against you. Queen Alysanne prayed daily for her niece Arya and blamed herself for the child's flight, but she blamed her sister more. Jaehaerys, who had taken little note of Arya even during the years she had been his heir, chided himself now for that neglect, but it was Balerion who most concerned him, for he well understood the dangers of a beast so powerful in the hands of an angry thirteen-year-old girl. Neither Reyna Targaryen's fruitless wanderings, nor the storm of ravens Grandmaster Benefier sent forth, had turned up any word of the princess or the dragon, beyond the usual lies, mistakes, and delusions. As the days went by, and the moon turned and turned again, the king began to fear that his niece was dead. Balerion is a willful beast, and not one to be trifled with, he told the council, to leap upon his back never having flown before, and take him up, not to fly about the castle, no, but out across the water. Like as not, he threw her off. Poor girl. And she lies now at the bottom of the narrow sea. Septum Barth did not concur. Dragons were not vagabond by nature, he pointed out. More often than not, they find a sheltered spot, a cave, or a ruined castle or mountaintop, and nest there, going forth to hunt, and thence returning. Once free of his rider, Balerion would surely have returned to his lair. It was his own surmise that, given the lack of any sightings of Balerion and Westeros, Princess Arya had likely flown him east across the narrow sea, to the vast fields of Essos. The queen concurred. If the girl were dead, I would know it. She is still alive. I feel it. All the agents and informers that Rigo Draz had engaged to hunt down Alyssa Farman and the stolen dragon eggs were now given a new mission, to find Princess Arya and Balerion. Reports soon began to come in from all up and down the narrow sea. Most proved useless, as with the dragon eggs. Rumors, lies, and false sightings, concocted for the sake of a reward. Some were third or fourth hand, others with such paucity of detail that they amounted to little more than, quote, I may have seen a dragon, or something big with wings. The most intriguing report came from the hills of Andals, north of Pentos, where shepherds spoke in fearful tones of a monster on the prowl, devouring entire flocks and leaving only bloody bones behind. 
nor were the shepherds themselves spared, should they chance to stumble on this beast, for this creature's appetite was by no means limited to mutton. Those who actually encountered the monster did not live to describe him, however, and none of the stories mentioned fire, which Jaehaerys took to mean that Beleriand could not be to blame. Nonetheless, to be certain, he sent a dozen men across the narrow sea to Pentos to try and hunt down this beast, led by Sir William the Wasp of his Kingsguard. Across the self-same narrow sea, unbeknownst to King's Landing, the shipwrights of Bravos had completed work on the Karak Sun Chaser, the dream Alyssa Farman had purchased with her stolen dragon's eggs. Unlike the galleys that slid forth daily from the arsenal of Bravos, she was not oared. This was a vessel meant for deep waters, not bays and coves and inland shallows. Foremasted, she carried as much sails as the swan ships of the Summer Isles, but with a broader beam and deeper hull that would allow her to store more sufficient provisions for longer voyages. When one Bravosi asked her if she meant to sail to Yi Ti, Lady Alyssa laughed and said, I may, but not by the route you think. The night before she was set to sail, she was summoned to the Sea Lord's palace, where the Sea Lord served her herring, beer, and caution. Go with care, my lady, he told her, but go. Men are hunting you, all up and down the narrow sea. Questions are being asked. Rewards are being offered. I would not care for you to be found in Bravos. We came here to be free of old Valeria, and you are Targaryens and Valerian to the bone. Sail far, sail fast. As the lady now known as Alice Westhill took leave of the Titan of Bravos, life in King's Landing continued as before. Unable to locate his lost niece, Jaehaerys Targaryen proceeded as he always would in times of trouble and gave himself over to his labors. In the quiet of the Red Keep's library, the king began work on what was to be one of the most significant of his achievements. With the able assistance of Septim Barth, Grand Maester Benefier, Lord Albin Massey, and Queen Alysanne, a foursome his grace dubbed My Even Smaller Council, Jaehaerys set out to codify, organize, and reform all the kingdom's laws. The Westeros that Aegon the Conqueror had found had consisted of seven kingdoms in truth and not just name, each with its own laws, customs, and traditions. Even within those kingdoms, there had been considerable variance from place to place. As Lord Massey would write, Before there were seven kingdoms, there were eight. Before that, nine. Then ten, or twelve, or thirty, and back and back. We speak of the hundred kingdoms of heroes, when there were actually ninety-seven at one time, one hundred thirty-two at another, and so on, the number forever changing as wars were lost and won and sons followed their fathers. Oft as not, the laws changed as well. This king was stern, this king was merciful, this one looked to the seven-pointed star for guidance, this one held to the ancient laws of the first men, this one ruled by whim, the other went one way when sober, and another when drunk. After thousands of years, the result was such a mass of contradictory precedents that every lord possessed of the power of pit and gallows, and, some who were not, felt free to rule however he might wish on any case that came before his seat. Confusion and disorder were offensive to Jaehaerys Targaryen, and, with the help of his smaller council, he set out to clean the stables. These seven kingdoms have one single king. It is time they had a single law as well. A task so monumental would not be one year's work, or tens. Simply gathering, organizing, and studying the existing laws would require two years, and the reforms that followed would continue for decades. Yet, here is where the great code of Septim Barth, who, in the end, would contribute thrice as much as any other man to the books of laws that resulted, began, in that autumn year of 55 AC. The king's labors would continue for many years to come. The queen's for nine turns of the moon. Early that same year, King Jaehaerys and the people of Westeros were thrilled to learn that Queen Alysanne was once again with child. Princess Daenerys shared their delight, though she told her mother in firm terms that she wanted a little sister. You sound like a queen already, laying down the law. 
her mother told her, laughing. Marriages had long been the means by which the great houses of Westeros bound themselves together. A reliable method of forging alliances and ending disputes. Just as the conqueror's wives had before her, Alysanne Targaryen delighted in making such matches. In 55 AC, she took particular pride in betrothals she arranged for two of the wise women who had served in her household since Dragonstone. Lady Janice Templeton would wed Lord Muller Dorn of the Uplands, whilst Lady Prunella Keltigar was joined in marriage to Uther Peake, Lord of Starspike, Lord of Dustonbury, and Lord of Whitegrove. Both were considered exceptional matches for the ladies in question, a triumph for the Queen. The tourney that Lord Redwine had proposed to celebrate the completion of the Dragon Pit was finally held at mid-year. Lists were raised in the fields west of the city halls, between the Lion Gate and King's Gate, and jousting there was said to be especially splendid. Lord Redwine's eldest son, Sir Robert, showed his prowess with a lance against the best the realm had to offer, whilst his brother Rickard won the squire's tourney and was knighted on the field by the king himself but the champion's laurels went to the gallant and handsome Sir Simon Dondarrion of Blackhaven, who won the love of the commons and queen alike when he crowned Princess Daenerys as his queen of love and beauty. No dragons had been settled in the dragon pit as yet, so that colossal edifice was chosen for the site of the tourney's grand melee. A clash of arms such as King's Landing had never seen before. Seventy-seven knights took part in eleven teams. The competitors began a horse, but once unhorsed, continued on foot, battling with sword, mace, axe, and morning star. When all the teams but one had been eliminated, the surviving members of the final team turned on one another, until only a single champion remained. Though the participants bore only blunted tourney weapons, the battles were hard fought and bloody, to the delight of the crowds. Two men were killed, and more than two score wounded. Queen Alysanne, wisely, forbade her favorites, Jonquil Drake and Tom the Strummer, from taking part. But the old Kega Ale once more took the field to the roars of approval from the commons. When he fell, the small folk found a new favorite, in the upjumped squire, Sir Harry Hogg, whose house name and pig's head helm earned him the style of Harry the Ham. Other notables who joined the melee included Sir Alan Bullock, late of Dragonstone, Rogar Baratheon's brothers, Sir Boris, Sir Garen, and Sir Ronald, an infamous hedge knight called Sir Guile the Cunning, and Sir Alastor Rain, champion of the Westerlands and master at arms at Casterly Rock. After hours of blood and clangor, however, the last man left standing was a strapping young knight from the Riverlands, a broad shouldered blonde bull called Sir Lucamore Strong. Soon after the conclusion of the tourney, Queen Alysanne left King's Landing for Dragonstone, there to await the birth of her child. The loss of Prince Aegon after only three days of life still weighed heavily upon her grace. Rather than subject herself to the rigors of travel or the demands of life at court, the queen sought the quiet of the ancient seat of her house, where her duties would be few. Septa Edith and Septa Lyra remained by Alysanne's side, together with a dozen fresh young maidens, chosen from amongst a hundred, who coveted the distinction of serving as a companion to the queen. Two of Rogar Baratheon's nieces were amongst those so honored, along with daughters and sisters of Lord Aaron, Vance, Rowan, Royce, and Dondarrion, and even a woman of the north, Mara Manderley, daughter to the Lord Theomore of White Harbor. To lighten their evenings, Her Grace also brought her favorite fool, the good wife, with his puppets. There were some at court who had misgivings about the Queen's desire to remove herself to Dragonstone. The island was damp and gloomy at the best of times, and, in autumn, strong winds and storms were common. The recent tragedies had only served to blacken the castle's reputation even further, and some feared that the ghosts of Reyna Targaryen's poisoned friends might haunt its halls. Queen Alysanne dismissed these concerns as foolishness. The king and I were so happy on Dragonstone, she told the doubters. I can think of no better place for our child to be born. Another royal progress had been planned for 55 AC, this time to the Westerlands. Just as she had when carrying Princess Daenerys, the queen refused to let the king cancel or postpone the trip, 
and sent him forth alone. Vermithor carried him across Westeros to the Golden Tooth, where the rest of his retinue caught up with him. From there, his grace visited Ashermark, the Crag, Case, Castamir, Tarbeck Hall, Lannisport, and Casterly Rock, and Crack Hall. Notable by its omission was Fair Isle. Unlike his sister, Reyna, Jaehaerys Targaryen was not a man given to making threats, but he had his own ways of making his disapproval felt. The king returned from the west a moon's turn before the queen was due, so he might be at her side when she delivered. The child came precisely when the maesters had said he would. A boy, clean-limbed and healthy, with eyes as pale as lilac. His hair, when it came in, was pale as well, shining like white gold, a color rare even in Valeria of old. Jaehaerys named him Amon. Daenerys will be cross with me, Alysanne said, as she put the princeling to her breast. She was most insistent on wanting a sister. Jaehaerys laughed at that and said, Next time. That night, at Alysanne's suggestion, he placed a dragon's egg in the prince's cradle. Thrilled by the news of Prince Aemon's birth, thousands of small folk lined the street outside the Red Keep when Jaehaerys and Alysanne returned to King's Landing a moon's turn later, in hopes of getting a glimpse of the new heir to the Iron Throne. Hearing their chants and cheers, the king finally mounted the ramparts of the castle's main gate and raised the boy over his head for all to see. Then, it was said, a roar went up so loud that it could be heard across the narrow sea. As the Seven Kingdoms celebrated, word reached the king that his sister, Reyna, had been seen again, this time at Greenstone, the ancient seat of House Eastermont on the Isle of the same name, off the shores of Cape Wrath. Here, she decided to linger for a time. The very first of Reyna's favorites, her cousin, Larissa Valerian, had been married to the second son of the Evanstar of Tarth, it may be recalled. Though her husband was dead, Lady Larissa had borne him a daughter, who had only recently been wed to the elderly Lord Eastermont. Rather than remain on Tarth or return to Driftmark, the widow had chosen to stay with her daughter on Greenstone after the wedding. That Lady Larissa's presence drew Reyna Targaryen to Eastermont cannot be doubted, for the island was elsewise singularly lacking in charm, being damp, windswept, and poor. With her daughter lost to her, and her dearest friends and favorites in the grave, it should not be surprising that Reyna sought solace with a companion of her childhood. It would have surprised, and enraged, the queen to know that another former favorite was passing close to her at that very moment. After stopping at Pentos to take on supplies, Alice Westhill and her Sun Chaser had made their way to Tyrosh, with only the narrowest part of the narrow sea betwixt them and Eastermont. The perilous passage through the pirate-infested waters of the Stepstones lay ahead, and Lady Alice was hiring crossbowmen and sellswords to see her safely through the straits to open water, as many a prudent captain did. The gods in their caprice chose to keep Queen Reyna and her betrayer ignorant of one another, however, and the Sun Chaser passed through the Sepstones without incident. Alice Westhill discharged her hirelings on Liz, taking on fresh water and provisions before turning west and setting sail for Old Town. Winter came to Westeros in 56 AC, and with it, grim news out of Essos. The men that King Jaehaerys had sent to investigate the great beast prowling the hills north of Pentos were all dead. Their commander, Sir William the Wasp, had engaged a guide in Pentos, a local who claimed to know where the monster lurked. Instead, he led them into a trap, and somewhere in the velvet hills of the Andals, Sir William and his men had been set upon by brigands. Though they had given a good account of themselves, the numbers were against them, and in the end, they were overwhelmed and slain. Sir William had been the last to fall, it was said. His head had been returned to one of Lord Rigo's agents in Pentos. There is no monster, Septim Barth concluded after hearing the sad tale. Only men stealing sheep and telling tales to frighten other men away. Miles Smallwood, the king's hand, urged the king to punish Pentos for the outrage. But Jaehaerys was unwilling to make war upon an entire city for the crimes of some outlaws. So the matter was put to rest, and the fate of Sir William the Wasp was inscribed in the White Book of the Kingsguard. To fill his place, 
Jaehaerys awarded a white cloak to Sir Lucamore Strong, the victor of the great melee in the Dragon Pit. More news came from Lord Rigo's agents across the water. One report spoke of a dragon being displayed in the fighting pits of Astapor, on Slaver's Bay. A savage beast with shorn wings, the slavers set against bulls, cave bears, and packs of human slaves armed with spears and axes, whilst thousands roared and shouted. Septim Barth dismissed the account at once. A wyvern beyond a doubt, he declared. The wyverns of Sothoros are oft taken for dragons by men who have never seen a dragon. Of far more interest to the king and council was the great fire that had swept across the disputed lands a fortnight past. Fanned by strong winds and fed by dry grasses, the blaze had raged for three days and three nights, engulfing half a dozen villages and one free company. The adventurers, who found themselves trapped between the onrushing flames and a Tyroshi host under the command of the Archon himself. Most had chosen to die upon Tyroshi's spears rather than be burned alive. Not a man of them had survived. The source of the fire remained a mystery. A dragon, Sir Miles Smallwood declared. What else could it be? Rigo Draz remained unconvinced. A lightning strike, he suggested. A cookfire, a drunk with a torch looking for a whore. The king agreed. If this were Balerion's doing, he surely would have been seen. The fires of Essos were far from the mind of the woman calling herself Alice Westhill in Old Town. Her eyes were fixed upon the other horizon, on the storm-lashed western seas. Her sun chaser had come to port in the last days of autumn, yet still she lingered at Dockside as Lady Alice searched for a crew to sail her. She was proposing to do what only a handful of the boldest mariners had ever dared attempt before. To sail beyond the sunset in search of lands undreamed of. And she did not want men aboard who might lose heart, rise up against her, and force her to turn back. She required men who shared her dream, and such were not easily found, even in Old Town. Then, as now, ignorant small folk and superstitious sailors clung to the belief that the world was flat and ended somewhere far to the west. Some spoke of walls of fire and boiling seas, some of black fogs that went on forever, some of the very gates of hell. Wiser men knew better. The sun and moon were spheres, as any man with eyes could see. Reason suggested that the world must be a sphere as well, and centuries of study had convinced the archmaesters of the conclave that there could be no doubt of that. The dragon lords of the freehold of Valeria had believed the same, as did the wise of many distant lands. From Karth to Yiti to the Isle of Leng, the same accord did not exist as regards to the size of the world. Even amongst the archmaesters of the Citadel, there was deep division on that question. Some believed the Sunset Sea to be so vast that no man could hope to cross it. Others argued it might be no wider than the Summer Sea, where it stretched from the arbor to Great Morak. A tremendous distance to be sure, but one that a bold captain might hope to navigate with the right ship. A western route to the silks and spices of E.T. and Leng could mean incalculable riches for the man who found it, if the sphere of the world was as small as these wise men suggested. Alice Westhill did not believe it was. The scant writings she left behind show that even as a child, Alyssa Farman was convinced that the world was, quote, far larger and far stranger than the maesters imagine. Not for her, the merchant's dream of reaching Ulthos and Asai by sailing west. Hers was a bolder vision, between Westeros and the far eastern shores of Essos and Ulthos, she believed, lay other lands and other seas waiting to be discovered. Another Essos, another Sothorios, another Westeros. Her dreams were full of sundering rivers and windswept plains and towering mountains with their shoulders in the clouds, of green islands, verdant in the sun, of strange beasts no man had tamed and queer fruits no man had tasted, of gold cities shining underneath the strange stars. She was not the first to dream this dream. Thousands of years before the conquest, when the kings of winter still reigned in the north, Brandon the shipwright had built an entire fleet of ships to cross the Sunset Sea. He took them west himself, never to return. His son and heir, another Brandon, 
burned the yards where they were built, and was known as Brandon the Burner forevermore. A thousand years later, Ironmen sailing out of Great Wick were blown off course onto a cluster of rocky islands, eight days sail to the northwest of any known shore. Their captain built a tower and a beacon there, took the name of Farwind, and called his seat the Lonely Light. His descendants still lived there, clinging to rocks where seals outnumbered men fifty to one. Even other Iron Men considered the Far Winds mad, some named them Selkies. Brandon the Shipwright, and the Ironborn who came after him, had both sailed the northern seas, where monstrous krakens, sea dragons, and leviathans the size of islands swam through the cold gray waters. And the freezing mists hid floating mountains made of ice. Alice Westhill did not intend to voyage in their wake. She would sail her sun chaser on a more southerly course, seeking warm blue waters and the steady winds she believed would carry her across the sunset sea. But first, she had to have a crew. Some men laughed at her, whilst others called her mad or cursed her to her face. Strange beasts, I, one rival captain told her. And like as not, you'll end up in the belly of one. A good portion of the gold that the Sea Lord had paid for her stolen dragon's eggs reposed safely in the vaults of the Iron Bank of Bravos, however, and with such wealth behind her, Lady Alice was able to tempt sailors by paying thrice the wages other captains could offer. Slowly, she began gathering willing hands. Inevitably, word of her efforts came to the attention of the Lord of Hightower. Lord Donald's grandsons, Eustace and Norman, both noted mariners in their own right, were sent to question her, and clap her in fetters if they felt it prudent. Instead, both men signed on with her, pledging their own ships and crews to her mission. After that, sailors clambered over one another in haste to join her crew. If the high towers were going, there were fortunes to be had. The Sun Chaser departed Old Town on the 23rd day of the third moon of 56 AC, making her way down, whispering sound for the open seas in company with Sir Norman Hightower's Autumn Moon and Sir Eustace Hightower's Lady Meredith. Their departure came not a day too soon, for word of Alice Westhill and her desperate search for a crew had finally reached King's Landing. King Jaehaerys saw through Lady Alyssa's false name at once, and immediately sent ravens to Lord Donal in Old Town, commanding him to take this woman into custody and deliver her to the Red Keep for questioning. The birds came too late, however, or, mayhaps, as some suggest even to this day, Donal the Delayer delayed again. Unwilling to risk the king's wrath, his lordship dispatched a dozen of his own swiftest ships to chase down Alice Westhill and his grandsons. But one by one, they straggled back to port, defeated. Seas are vast, and ships small, and none of Lord Donal's vessels could match the sun chaser for speed when the wind was in her sails. When word of her escape reached the Red Keep, the king pondered long and hard on chasing after Alyssa Farnman himself. No ship can sail as swiftly as a dragon flies, he reasoned. Mayhaps Vermithor could find her, where Lord Hightower's ships could not. The very notion terrified Queen Alysanne, however. Even dragons cannot stay aloft forever, she pointed out. And such charts as existed of the Sunset Sea showed neither islands nor rocks to rest upon. Grand Maester Benefier and Septim Barth concurred, and against their opposition, His Grace reluctantly put the idea aside. The thirteenth day of the fourth moon of 56 AC dawned, cold and gray, with a blustery wind blowing from the east. Court records tell us that Jaehaerys I Targaryen broke his fast with an envoy of the Iron Bank of Bravos, who had come to collect the annual payment on the crown's loan. It was a contentious meeting. Alyssa Farman was still very much in the king's thoughts, and he had certain knowledge that her sun chaser had been built in Bravos. His grace demanded to know if the Iron Bank had financed the building of the ship, and whether they had any knowledge of the stolen dragon eggs. The banker, for his part, denied all. Elsewhere in the Red Keep, Queen Alysanne spent the morning with her children. Princess Daenerys had finally warmed to her brother, Aemon, though she still wanted a little sister. Septim Barth was in the library, Grand Maester Benefer in his rookery. Across the city, Lord Corbray was inspecting the men of the East Barracks of the City Watched, whilst Rigo Draz entertained a young lady of negotiable virtue in his manse below the Dragon Pit. 
All of them would long remember what they were doing when they heard the blast of a horn ringing through the morning air. The sound of it ran down my spine like a cold knife, the queen would later say, though I could not have said why. In a lonely watchtower, overlooking the waters of Blackwater Bay, a guard had glimpsed dark wings in the distance and sounded the alarm. He sounded the horn again as the wings grew larger, and a third time when he saw the dragon plane black against the clouds. Balerion had returned to King's Landing. It had been long years since the Black Dread had last been seen in the skies above the city, and the sight filled many a King's Lander with dread. Wondering if somehow Magor the Cruel had returned from beyond the grave to mount him once again. Alas, the rider clinging to his neck was not a dead king, but a dying child. Balerion's shadow swept across the yards and halls of the Red Keep as he came down, his huge wings buffeting the air, to land in the inner ward by Magor's holdfast. Scarcely had he touched the ground than Princess Arya slid from his back. Even those who had known her best during her years at court scarce recognized the girl. She was near enough to naked as to make no matter, her clothing no more than rags and tatters clinging to her arms and legs. Her hair was tangled and matted, her limbs as thin as sticks. Please, she cried to the knights and squires and serving men who had seen her descend. Then, as they came rushing towards her, she said, I never... and collapsed. Sir Lucamore Strong had been at his post on the bridge across the dry moat surrounding Magor's holdfast. Shoving aside the other onlookers, he lifted the princess into his arms and carried her across the castle to Grand Maester Benefir. Later, he would tell anyone who would listen that the girl was flushed and burning with fever, her skin so hot he could feel it even through the enameled scale of his armor. She had blood in her eyes as well, the knight claimed, and, quote, there was something inside her, something moving that made her shudder and twist in my arms. He did not tell these tales for long, though. The next day, King Jaehaerys sent for him and commanded him to speak no more of the princess. The king and queen were sent for at once, but when they reached the maester's chambers, Benefir denied them entry. You do not want to see her like this, he told them, and I would be remiss if I allowed you any closer. Guards were posted at the door to keep servants away as well. Only Septim Barth was admitted to administer the rites for the dying. Benefir did what he could for the stricken princess, giving her milk of the poppy and immersing her in a tub of ice to bring her fever down. But his efforts were to no avail. Whilst hundreds crowded into the Red Keep's sept to pray for her, Jaehaerys and Alysanne kept vigil outside the maester's door. The sun had set and the hour of the bat was at hand when Barth emerged to announce that Arya Targaryen was dead. The princess was consigned to the flames the very next day at sunrise, her body wrapped in fine white linen from head to toe. Grandmaster Benefir, who had prepared for her the funeral pyre, looked half dead himself. Lord Redwine confided to his sons. The king announced that his niece had died of a fever and asked the realm to pray for her. King's Landing mourned for a few days before life resumed as before, and that was the end of it. Mysteries remained, however. Even now, centuries later, we are no closer to knowing the truth. More than 40 men have served the Iron Throne as Grand Maester. Their journals, letters, account books, memoirs, and court calendars are our single best record of the events they witnessed. But not all of them were equally diligent, whereas some left us volumes of letters, full of empty words, never failing to note what the king ate for supper and whether he enjoyed it, Others set down no more than half a dozen missives in a year. In this regard, Benefir ranks near the top, and his letters and journals provide us with detailed accounts of all that he saw, did, and witnessed whilst in service to King Jaehaerys and his uncle Magor before him. And yet, in all of Benefir's writings, there was not a single word to be found concerning the return of Arya Targaryen and her stolen dragon to King's Landing, nor the death of the young princess. Fortunately, Septim Barth was not so reticent, and it is to his own account we must now turn. Barth wrote, It has been three days since the princess perished, and I have not slept. I do not know that I will ever sleep again. The mother is merciful, I have always believed, and the father above judges each man justly. But there was no mercy and no justice in what befell our poor princess. 
How could the gods be so blind or so uncaring as to emit such horror? Or is it possible that there are other deities in the universe? Monstrous evil gods, such as the priests of Red Roller preach against, against whose malice the kings of men and the gods of men are not but flies. I do not know. I do not want to know. If this makes me a faithless septum, so be it. Grandmaster Benefer and I have agreed to tell no one all of what we saw and experienced in the chambers as that poor child lay dying. Not the king, nor the queen, nor her mother, nor even the archmaesters of the citadel. But the memories will not leave me, so I shall set them down here. Mayhaps by the time they are found and read, men will have gained a better understanding of such evils. We have told the world that Princess Arya died of a fever, and that is broadly true. But it was a fever, as I have never seen before, and hope to never see again. The girl was burning, her skin was flushed and red, and when I laid my hand upon her brow to learn how hot she was, it was as if I had thrust my hand into a pot of boiling oil. There was scarce an ounce of flesh upon her bones, so gaunt and starved did she appear, but we could observe certain swellings inside her, as her skin bulged out and then sunk down again, as if, no, not as if, for this was the truth of it. There were things inside her, living things, moving and twisting, mayhaps searching for a way out, and giving her such pain that even milk of the poppy gave her no succease. We told the king, as we must surely tell her mother, that Arya never spoke, but that is a lie. I pray that I shall soon forget some of the things she whispered through her cracked and bleeding lips. I cannot forget how oft she begged for death. All the maester's arts were powerless against her fever, if indeed we can call such a horror by such a commonplace name. The simplest way to say it is that the poor child was cooking from within. Her flesh grew darker and darker and began to crack, until her skin resembled nothing so much, seven save me, as pork crackling. Thin tendrils of smoke issued from her mouth, her nose, even, most obscenely, from her nether lips. By then, she had ceased to speak, though the things within her continued to move. Her very eyes cooked within her skull, and finally burst like two eggs left in a pot of boiling water for too long. I thought that was the most hideous thing I would ever see, but I was quickly disabused of such a notion, for a worse horror was awaiting me. That came when Benefer and I lowered the poor child into a tub and covered her with ice. The shock of that immersion stopped her heart at once, I tell myself. If so, that was a mercy, for that was when the things inside her came out. The things, mother have mercy. I do not know how to speak of them. They were worms with faces, snakes with hands, twisting, slimy, unspeakable things that seemed to writhe and pulse and squirm as they came bursting from her flesh. Some were no bigger than my little finger. But one, at least, was as long as my arm. Oh, warrior protect me. The sounds they made. They died, though. I must remember that. Cling to that. Whatever they might have been, they were creatures of heat and fire, and they did not love the ice. Oh, no. One after another, they thrashed and writhed and died before my eyes. Thank the seven. I will not presume to give them names. They were horrors. The first part of Septim Barth's account ends there, but some days later, he returned and resumed. Princess Arya is gone, but not forgotten. The faithful pray for her sweet soul every morn and every night. Outside the Septs, the same questions are on every lip. The princess was missing for more than a year. Where could she have gone? What could have happened to her? What brought her home? Was Beleriand the monster believed to haunt the velvet hills of Andals? Did his flames start the fire that swept across the disputed lands? Could the Black Dread have flown as far as Astapor to be the dragon in the pit? No, and no, and no. These are fables. If we put aside such distraction, however, the mystery remains. Where did Arya Targaryen go after fleeing Dragonstone? Queen Rhaena's first thought was that she had flown to King's Landing. The princess had made no secret of a wish to return to court. When that proved wrong, Raina next looked to Fair Isle and Old Town. 
Both of these made sense after a fashion, but Arya was not to be found at either place, nor anywhere in Westeros. Others, including the Queen and myself, took this to mean that the princess had flown east, not west, and would be found somewhere in Essos. The girl might well have thought the free cities to be beyond her mother's grasp, and Queen Elysane, in particular, seemed convinced that Arya was fleeing her mother as much as Dragonstone itself. Yet Lord Rigo's agents and informers could find no hint of her across the narrow sea. Not even a whisper of a dragon. Why? Though I cannot offer certain proof, I can suggest an answer. It seems to me that we have all been asking the wrong question. Arya Targaryen was still well shy of her thirteenth name day on the morning she slipped from her mother's castle. Though no stranger to dragons, she had never ridden one before, and for reasons we may never understand, she chose Beleriand as her mount, instead of any one of the younger, more tractable dragons she might have claimed. Driven as she was by her conflicts with her mother, mayhaps she simply wanted a beast larger and more fearsome than Queen Reyna's dreamfire. It might also have been a desire to tame the beast that had slain her father and his own dragon, though Princess Arya had never known her father, and it is hard to know what feelings she might have had about him and his death. Regardless of her reasons, the choice was made. The princess might well have intended to fly to King's Landing, just as her mother suspected. It might have been her thought to seek out her old twin sister in Old Town, or to go seeking after Lady Alyssa Farman, who had once promised to take her adventuring. Whatever her plans, they did not matter. It is one thing to leap upon a dragon, and quite another thing to bend him to your will. Particularly, a beast as old and fierce as the Black Dread. From the very start we have asked, where did Arya take Balerion? We should have been asking, where did Balerion take Arya? Only one answer makes sense. Recall, if you will, that Balerion was the largest and oldest of the three dragons that King Aegon and his sisters rode to conquest. Vagar and Meraxes had hatched on Dragonstone. Balerion alone had come to the island with Aenar the Exile and Danis the Dreamer, the youngest of the five dragons they brought with them. The older dragons had died during the intervening years, but Balerion lived on, growing ever larger, fearsful, and more willful. If we discount the tales of certain sorcerers and mountebanks, as we should, he is mayhaps the only living creature in the world that knew Valeria before the doom. And that is where he took the poor doomed child clinging to his back. If she went willingly, I would be most surprised. But she had neither the knowledge nor force of will to turn him. What befell her on Valeria I cannot surmise. Judging from the conditions in which she returned to us, I do not even care to contemplate it. The Valerians were more than dragon lords. They practiced blood magic and other dark arts as well, delving deep into the earth for secrets best left buried and twisting the flesh of beasts and men into monstrous fashion and creating unnatural chimeras. For these sins, the gods in their wrath struck them down. Valeria is accursed, all men agree, and even the boldest sailor steers well clear of its smoking bones. But we would be mistaken to believe that nothing lives there now. The things we found in Arya Targaryen live there now, I would submit, along with other such horrors as we cannot even begin to imagine. I have written at length here about how the princess died, but there is something else, something even more frightening, that requires mention. Valerian had wounds as well. That enormous beast, the Black Dread, the most fearsome dragon ever to soar through the skies of Westeros, returned to King's Landing with half-healed scars that no man recalled ever having seen before, and a jagged rent down his left side almost nine feet long, a gaping red wound from which blood still dripped, hot and smoking. The lords of Westeros are proud men, and the septums of the faith and the maesters of the citadel in their own ways are prouder still. But there is much and more of the nature of the world that we do not understand, and may never understand. Mayhaps that is a mercy. The Father made men curious, some say, to test our faith. It is our own abiding sin that whenever I come upon a door, I must needs see what lies upon the farther side. But certain doors are best left unopened. Arya Targaryen went through such a door. Septum Barth's account ends there.
He would never again touch the fate of Princess Arya in any of his writings, and even these words would be sealed away amongst his privy papers, to remain undiscovered for almost a hundred years. The horrors he had witnessed had a profound effect upon the Septum, however, exciting the very hunger for knowledge he called, My Own Abiding Sin. It was subsequent to this that Barth began the researches and investigations that would ultimately lead him to write Dragons, Worms, and Wyverns, Their Unnatural History, a volume that the Citadel would condemn as provocative but unsound, and Baylor the Blessed would order expunged and destroyed. It is likely that Septim Barth discussed his suspicions with the king as well, though the matter never came before the small council. Later that same year, Jaehaerys issued a royal edict forbidding any ship suspected of having visited the Valerian Islands or sailed the Smoking Sea from landing at any port or harbor in the Seven Kingdoms. The king's own subjects were likewise forbidden from visiting Valeria, under pain of death. Not long thereafter, Valerian became the first of the Targaryen dragons to be housed in the Dragon Pit. Its long brick-lined tunnels, sunk deep into the hillside, had been fashioned after the manner of caves, and were five times as large as their layers on Dragonstone. Three younger dragons soon joined the Black Dread under the Hill of Rhaenys, whilst Vermithor and Silverwing remained at the Red Keep, close to their riders. To ascertain there would be no repetition of Princess Arya's escape on Beleriand, the king decreed that all the dragons should be guarded night and day, regardless of where they laired. A new order of guards was created for this purpose, the Dragon Keepers. 77 strong, and clad in suits of gleaming black armor, their helms crested by a row of dragon scales that continued, diminishing, down their backs. Little and less need be said of the return of Reyna Targaryen from Eastermont after her daughter's death. By the time the raven reached her grace at Greenstone, the princess had already died and been burned. Only ashes and bones remained for her mother when Dreamfire delivered her to the Red Keep. It would seem I'm doomed to always come too late. When the king offered to have the ashes interred on Dragonstone, beside those of King Aegon and the other dead of House Targaryen, Rhaena refused. She hated Dragonstone, she reminded his grace. She wanted to fly. And so saying, she took her child's ashes high into the sky on Dreamfire and scattered them upon the winds. It was a melancholy time. Dragonstone was still hers if she wanted it, Jairus told his sister, but Rhaena refused that as well. There is nothing there for me now but grief and ghosts. When Alisane asked if she would return to Greenstone, Reyna shook her head. There's a ghost there as well, a kinder ghost, but no less sad. The king suggested that she remain with them at court, even offering her a seat on the small council. That made his sister laugh. Oh, brother, you sweet man. I fear you would not like any council I might offer. Then, Queen Alisane took her sister's hand in hers and said, you are still a young woman. If you like, we could find some kind and gentle lord who would cherish you as we do. You could have other children. That only served to bring a snarl to Reyna's lips. She snatched her hand away from the queen's and said, I fed my last husband to my dragon. If you make me take another, I may eat him myself. The place where King Jaehaerys settled his sister Reyna in the end was mayhaps the most unlikely seat of all. Harrenhal. Jordan Towers, one of the last lords to remain faithful to Magor the Cruel, had died of a congestion of the chest, and Black Harren's vast ruin had passed to his last surviving son, named after the late king. All of his older brothers having perished in King Magor's wars, Magor Towers was the last of his line, and sickly and impoverished as well. In a castle built to house thousands, Towers dwelt alone, but for a cook and three elderly men-at-arms. The castle has five colossal towers, the king pointed out, and the towers boy occupies part of one. You can have the other four. Reyna was amused by that. One will suffice, I am sure. I have a smaller household than he does. When Alisane reminded her that Harrenhal too was said to have ghosts, Reyna shrugged. They are not my ghosts. They will not trouble me. And thus it came to pass that Reyna Targaryen, daughter of one king, wife to two, sister to a third, spent the final years of her life in the aptly named Widow's Tower of Harrenhal, whilst across the castle yard, a sickly youth, named after the king who had slain the father of her children, maintained his own household in the Tower of Dread. 
Curiously, we are told, in time, Reyna and Magor Towers came to forge a friendship of sorts. After his death in 61 AC, Reyna took his servants into her own household and continued to maintain them until her own death. Reyna Targaryen died in 73 AC at 50 years of age. After the death of her daughter Arya, she never again visited King's Landing or Dragonstone, nor played any part in ruling them. Though she did fly to Old Town once a year to visit with her remaining daughter, Hralia, a Septa at the Starry Sept. Her hair of gold and silver turned white before the end, and the small folk of the Riverlands feared her as a witch. Travelers who turned up at the gates of Harren Hall in hopes of hospitality were given bread and salt and the privilege of a night's shelter during those years, but not the honor of the Queen's company. Those who were fortunate spoke of glimpsing her on the castle battlements or seeing her coming and going on her dragon, for Reyna continued to ride Dreamfire until the end, just as she had in the beginning. When she died, King Jaehaerys ordained that she be burned at Harrenhal and her ashes interred there. My brother, Aegon died at the hands of our uncle in the battle beneath the god's eye, his grace said at her funeral pyre. His wife, my sister Reyna, was not with him at the battle, but she died that day as well. With Reyna's death, Jaehaerys granted Harrenhal and all its lands and incomes to Sir Bywin Strong, the brother of Sir Lucamore Strong, of his Kingsguard, and a renowned knight in his own right. We have wandered decades ahead of our tale, however, for the stranger did not come for Reyna Targaryen until 73 AC, and much, and more, was to pass in King's Landing and the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros before that, for both good and ill. In 57 AC, Jaehaerys and his queen found cause to rejoice again when the gods blessed them with another son, Balon, he was named, after one of the Targaryen lords who had ruled Dragonstone before the conquest, himself a second son. Though smaller than his brother, Aemon, at birth, the new babe was louder and lustier, and his wet nurses complained that they had never known a child to suck so hard. Only two days before his birth, the White Ravens had flown from the Citadel to announce the arrival of Spring, so Balon was immediately dubbed the Spring Prince. Prince Aemon was two when his brother was born, Princess Daenerys, four. The two were little alike. The princess was a lively, laughing child who bounced about the Red Keep day and night, flying everywhere on a broomstick dragon that had become her favorite toy. Mud spattered and grass stained, she was a trial to her mother and her maids alike for they were forever losing track of her. Prince Aemon, on the other hand, was a very serious boy. Cautious, careful, and obedient. Though he could not as yet read, he loved being read too, and Queen Alysanne, laughing, was oft heard to say that his first word had been, why? As the children grew, Grandmaster Benefier watched them closely. The wounds left by the enmity between the Conqueror's son, Ennis and Magor were still fresh in the minds of many older lords, and Benefir worried, lest these two boys likewise turn on one another, to bathe the realm in blood. He need not have been concerned. Save mayhaps for twins, no brothers could ever have been closer than the sons of Jaehaerys Targaryen. As soon as he grew old enough to talk, Balon followed his brother, Aemon, everywhere, and tried his best to imitate him in everything he did. When Aemon was given his first wooden sword to begin his training in arms, Balon was judged to be too young to join him, but that did not stop him. He made his own sword from a stick and rushed into the yard anyway to begin whacking at his brother, reducing their master at arms to helpless laughter. Thereafter, Balon went everywhere with his stick sword, even to bed, to the despair of his mother and her maids. Prince Aemon was shy around the dragons at first, Benefir observed, but not so Balon who reportedly smote Balerion on the snout the first time he entered the dragon pit. He's either brave or mad, that one, old sour Sam observed. And from that day forth, the Spring Prince was also known as Balon the Brave. The young princes loved their sister to distraction. It was plain to see, and Daenerys delighted in the boys, especially in telling them what to do. Grandmaster Benefir noted something else, however. Jaehaerys loved all three children fiercely, but from the moment Aemon had been born, the king began to speak of him as his heir, to Queen Alysanne's displeasure. Daenerys is older, she would remind his grace. She is first in line, she should be queen. The king would never disagree, except to say, 
She shall be queen. When she and Amon marry, they will rule together, just as we have. But Benefir could see that the king's words did not entirely please the queen, as he noted in his letters. Returning once again to 57 AC, that was also the year wherein Jaehaerys dismissed Lord Miles Smallwood as Hand of the King. Though undoubtedly a leal man, and well-intentioned, his lordship had shown himself to be ill-suited to the small council, as he himself would say, I was made to sit a horse, not a cushion. An older king, and wiser, this time, his grace told his council that he did not intend to waste a fortnight hashing over half a hundred names. This time, he would have the hand he wanted, Septum Barth. When Lord Corbray reminded the king of Barth's low birth, Jaehaerys shrugged off his objections. If his father beat out swords and shod horses, so be it. A knight needs his sword, a horse needs its shoes, and I need Barth. The new hand of the king departed within days of his elevation, taking ship for Bravos to consult with the Sea Lord and the Iron Bank. He was accompanied by Sir Giles Morrigan and six guardsmen, but only Septim Barth took part in the discussions. The purpose of his mission was a grave one, war or peace. King Jaehaerys had great admiration for the city of Bravos. Barth told the Sea Lord, for that reason, he had not come himself, understanding as he did the Free City's bitter history with Valeria and its dragon lords. If his hand was not able to settle the matter at hand amicably, however, his grace would have no choice but to come himself on Vermithor for what Barth termed vigorous discussions. When the Sea Lord inquired as to what the matter at hand might be, the Septum gave him a sad smile and said, Is this how it must be played? We are speaking of three eggs. Need I say more? The Sea Lord said, I admit to nothing. If I was in possession of such eggs, however, it could only be because I purchased them. From a thief. How shall that be proved? Has this thief been seized, tried, found guilty? Bravos is a city of laws. Who is the rightful owner of these eggs? Can they show me proof of ownership? His grace can show you proof of dragons. That made the Sea Lord smile. The Veiled Threat. Your king is most adroit at that, stronger than his father, more subtle than his uncle. Yes, I know Jaehaerys could do this to us, if he chose. Bravosi have a long memory, and we remember the dragon lords of old. There are certain things that we might do to your king as well, however. Shall I enumerate? Or do you prefer the veil threat? However it pleases your lordship. As you will. Your king could burn my cities down to ash. I do not doubt. Thousands and thousands would die in dragon flame. Men, women, and children. I do not have the power to wreak the sorts of destruction upon Westeros. Such cell swords as I would hire would flee before your knights. My fleets could sweep yours from the sea for a time, but my ships are made of wood, and wood burns. However, in this city, there is a certain guild, let's say whose members are very skilled at their chosen profession. They could not destroy King's Landing, nor fill its streets with corpses, but they could kill a few, a well-chosen few. His grace is protected day and night by the King's God. Knights, yes, such as a man waits for you outside, if indeed he is still waiting. What would you say if I were to tell you that Sir Giles is already dead? When Septim Barth began to rise, the Sea Lord waved him back to his seat. No, please, no need to rush away. I said, what if? I did consider it. They are most skilled. As I said, had I done so, however, you might have acted unwisely, and many more good people might have died. That is not my desire. Threats make me uncomfortable. Westerosi may be warriors, but we Bravosi are traders. Let us trade. Septim Barth settled back down. What do you offer? I do not have these eggs, of course, the Sea Lord said. You cannot prove elsewise. If I did have them, however, well, until they hatch, they are but stones. Would your king begrudge me three pretty stones? Now if I had three chickens, I might understand his concern. I do admire your Jaehaerys, though. He is a great improvement from his uncle. And Bravos does not wish to see him so unhappy. So instead of the stones, let me offer gold. And that was when the real bargaining began. 
There are those even today who insist that Septim Barth was made a fool of by the Sea Lord, that he was lied to, cheated, and humiliated. They point to the fact that he returned to King's Landing without a single dragon's egg. This is true. What he did bring back was not of inconsiderable value, however. At the Sea Lord's urging, the Iron Bank of Bravos forgave the entire remaining principle of its loan to the Iron Throne. At a stroke, the crown's debt had been cut in half. And all at the cost of three stones, Barth told the king. The Sea Lord had best hope that they remain stones, Jaehaerys said. If I should hear so much as a whisper of chickens, his palace will be the first to burn. The agreement with the Iron Bank would have great impact for all the people of the realm over the coming years and decades, though the extent of that was not immediately apparent. The king's shrewd master of coin, Rigo Draz, pored over the crown's debts and incomes carefully after Septim Barth's return, and concluded that the coin that would previously have had to be sent to Bravos could now be safely diverted to a project the king had long wished to undertake at home. Further improvements to King's Landing. Jaehaerys had widened and straightened the streets of the city and put down cobblestones where previously there had been mud, but much and more remained to be done. King's Landing in its present state could not compare to Old Town, nor even Lannisport, let alone the splendid free cities across the Narrow Sea. His grace was determined that it should, accordingly. He set out plans for a series of drains and sewers to carry the city's offal and night soil under the streets of the river. Septim Barth drew the king's attention to an even more urgent problem. King's Landing's drinking water was fit only for horses and swine, in the opinion of many. The river water was muddy, and the king's new sewers would soon make it worse. The waters of the Blackwater Bay were brackish at the best of times and salty at the worst. Whilst the king and his court and the city's highborn drank ale and mead and wine, these foul waters were oft the only choice for the poor. To address the problem, Barth proposed sinking wells, some inside the city proper and others to the north beyond the walls. A series of glazed clay pipes and tunnels would carry the fresh water into the city where it would be stored in four huge cisterns and made available to the small folk from public fountains in certain squares and crossroads. Barth's scheme was costly, beyond a doubt, and Rigo Draz and King Jaehaerys balked at the expense, until Queen Alysanne served each of them a tankard of river water at the next council meeting, and dared them to drink of it. The water went undrunk, but the wells and pipes were soon approved. Construction would require more than a dozen years, but in the end, the Queen's fountains provided clean water for Kingslanders for many generations to come. Several years had passed since the king had last made a progress, so plans were laid in 58 AC for Jaehaerys and Alysanne to make their first visit to Winterfell and the north. Their dragons would be with them, of course, but beyond the neck, the distances were great and the roads poor, and the king had grown tired of flying ahead and waiting for his escorts to catch up. This time, he decreed, his king's guard, servants, and retainers would go ahead of him, to make things ready for his arrival. And thus it was that three ships set sail from King's Landing for White Harbor, where he and the Queen were to make their first stop. The gods in the Free Cities had other plans, however. Even as the King's ships were beating their way north, envoys from Pentos and Tyrosh called upon his grace in the Red Keep. The two cities had been at war for three years and were now desirous of making peace but could not agree where they might meet to discuss terms. The conflict had caused serious disruption to trade upon the Narrow Sea, to the extent that King Jaehaerys had offered both cities his help in ending their hostilities. After long discussion, the Archon of Tyrosh and the Prince of Pentos had agreed to meet in King's Landing to settle their differences, provided that Jaehaerys would act as an intermediary between them and guarantee the terms of any resulting treaty. It was a proposal that neither the king nor his council felt he could refuse, but it would mean postponing his grace's planned progress to the north, and there was concern that the notoriously prickly Lord of Winterfell might take that for a slight. Queen Alysanne provided the solution. She would go ahead, as planned, alone, whilst the king played host to the prince and Archon. Jaehaerys could join her at Winterfell as soon as the peace had been concluded, and so it was agreed. 
Queen Alisane's travels began in the city of White Harbor, where tens of thousands of northerners turned out to cheer her and gape at Silverwing with awe and a bit of terror. It was the first time any of them had seen a dragon. The size of the crowd surprised even their lord. I had not known there were so many small folk in the city, Theomor Manderley is reported to have said. Where did they all come from? The Manderleys were unique amongst the great houses of the north. Having originated in the Reach, centuries before, they had found refuge near the mouth of the White Knife when rivals drove them from their rich lands along the Mander. Though fiercely loyal to the Starks of Winterfell, they had brought their own gods with them from the south, and still worshipped the Seven and kept the traditions of knighthood. Alisane Targaryen, ever desirous of binding the Seven Kingdoms closer together, saw an opportunity in Lord Theomor's famously large family, and promptly set about arranging marriages. By the time she took her leave, two of her ladies-in-waiting had been betrothed to his lordship's younger sons, and a third to a nephew. His eldest daughter and three nieces, meanwhile, had been added to the Queen's own party, with the understanding that they would travel south with her, and there, be pledged to suitable lords and knights of the king's court. Lord Manderley entertained the queen lavishly. At the welcoming feast, an entire oryx was roasted, and his lordship's daughter, Jessamine, acted as the queen's cupbearer, filling her tankard with a strong northern ale that her grace pronounced finer than any wine she had ever tasted. Manderley also staged a small tourney in the queen's honor to show the prowess of his knights. One of the fighters, though no knight, was revealed to be a woman, a wildling girl who had been captured by rangers north of the Wall and given to one of Lord Manderley's household knights to foster. Delighted by the girl's daring, Alisane summoned her own sworn shield, Jonquil Drake, and the wildling and the Scarlet Shadow dueled spear against sword whilst the Northmen roared in approval. A few days later, the Queen convened her woman's court in Lord Manderley's own hall, a thing hitherto unheard of in the North and more than 200 women and girls gathered to share their thoughts, concerns, and grievances with her grace. After taking leave of White Harbor, the Queen's retinue sailed up the White Knife to its rapids, then proceeded overland to Winterfell, whilst Alisane herself flew ahead on Silverwing. The warmth of her reception at White Harbor was not to be duplicated at the ancient seat of the kings in the north, where Alaric Stark and his sons alone emerged to greet her when her dragon landed before his castle gates. Lord Alaric had a flinty reputation, a hard man, people said, stern and unforgiving, tight-fisted, almost to the point of being humorless, joyless, cold. Even Theomor Manderley, who was his bannerman, had not disagreed. Stark was well respected in the north, he said, but not loved. Lord Manderley's fool had put it elsewise. Methinks Lord Alaric has not moved his bowels since he was twelve. Her reception at Winterfell did nothing to disabuse the Queen's fears as to what she might expect from House Stark. Even before dismounting to bend the knee, Lord Alaric looked askance at her grace's clothing and said, I hope you brought something warmer than that. He then proceeded to declare that he did not want her dragon inside the walls. I've not seen Harrenhal, but I know what happened there. Her knights and ladies he would receive when they got here. And the king too, if he can find the way. But they should not overstay their welcome. This is the north, and winter is coming. We cannot feed a thousand men for long. When the queen assured him that only a tenth that number would be coming, Lord Alaric grunted and said, that's good. Fewer would be even better. As had been feared, he was plainly unhappy that King Jaehaerys had not dined to accompany her, and confessed to being uncertain how to entertain a queen. If you were expecting balls and masquerades and dances, you have come to the wrong place. Lord Alaric had lost his wife three years earlier, when the queen expressed regret that she had never had the pleasure of meeting Lady Stark. The Northman said, She was a moment of Bear Isle and no lady by your lights. But she took an axe to a pack of wolves when she was twelve, killed two of them, and sewed a cloak from their skins. She gave me two strong sons as well, and a daughter as sweet to look upon as any of your southern ladies. When her grace suggested that she would be pleased to help arrange marriages for his sons to the daughters of great southern lords, Lord Stark refused brusquely. We keep the old gods in the north, he told the queen, 
When my boys take a wife, they will wed before a heart tree, not in some southern sept. Alisane Targaryen did not yield easily, however. The lords of the south honored the old gods as well as the new, she told Lord Alaric. Most every castle that she knew had a godswood as well as a sept, and there were still certain houses that had never accepted the seven, no more than the Northmen had, the Blackwoods and the Riverlands chief amongst them, and mayhaps as many as a dozen more. Even a lord as stern and flinty as Alaric Stark found himself helpless before Queen Alysanne's stubborn charm. He allowed that he would think on what she had said and raise the matter with his sons. The longer the queen stayed, the more Lord Alaric warmed to her, and in time, Alysanne came to realize that not everything that was said of him was true. He was careful with his coin, but not stingy. He was not humorless at all, though his humor had an edge to it, sharp as a knife. His sons and daughter, and the people of Winterfell, seemed to love him well enough. Once the initial frost had thawed, his lordship took the queen hunting after elk and wild boar in the wolf's wood, showed her the bones of a giant, and allowed her to rummage as she pleased through his modest castle library. He even dined to approach Silverwing, though warily. The women of Winterfell were taken by the queen's charms as well. Once they grew to know her, her grace became particularly close with Lord Alaric's daughter, Alara. When the rest of the queen's party finally turned up at the castle gates, after struggling through trackless bogs and summer snows, the meat and mead flowed freely, despite the king's absence. Things were not going as well at King's Landing, meanwhile. The peace talks dragged on for longer than they anticipated, for the acrimony between the two free cities ran deeper than Jaehaerys had known. When His Grace attempted to strike a balance, both sides accused him of favoring the other, whilst the prince and the archon dickered, fights began to break out between their men across the city, in inns, brothels, and wine sinks. A Pentoshi guardsman was set upon and killed, and three nights later, the Archon's own galley was set afire where she was docked. The king's departure was delayed, and delayed again. In the north, Queen Alysanne grew restless while waiting, and decided to take her leave of Winterfell for a time and visit the men of the Night's Watch at Castle Black. The distance was not negligible, even flying. Her grace landed at the last hearth and several smaller keeps and holdfasts on her way, to the surprise and delight of their lords, whilst a portion of her tail scrambled after her, the rest remained in Winterfell. Her first sight of the wall from above took Alysanne's breath away, her grace would later tell the king. There had been some concern how the queen might be received at Castle Black, for many of the Black Brothers had been poor fellows and warrior sons before those orders were abolished. But Lord Stark sent ravens ahead to warn of her coming, and the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Lothor Burley, assembled 800 of his finest men to receive her. That night, the Black Brothers feasted the Queen on mammoth meat, washed down with mead and stout. As dawn broke the next day, Lord Burley took her grace to the top of the wall. Here the world ends, he told her, gesturing at the vast green expanse of the haunted forest beyond. Burley was apologetic for the quality of food and drink presented to the Queen, and the rudeness of the accommodations at Castle Black. We do what we can, your grace, the Lord Commander explained, but our beds are hard, our halls are cold, and our food is nourishing, the Queen finished, and that is all I require. It will please me to eat as you do. The men of the Night's Watch were as thunderstruck by the Queen's dragon as the people of White Harbor had been, though the Queen herself noted that Silverwing does not like this wall. Though it was summer, and the wall was weeping, the chill of the ice could still be felt whenever the winds blew, and every gust would make the dragon hiss and snap. Thrice I flew Silverwing high above Castle Black, and thrice I tried to take her north beyond the wall, Alysanne wrote to Jaehaerys. But every time she veered back south again and refused to go. Never before has she refused to take me where I wished to go. I laughed about it when I came down again, so the Black Brothers would not realize anything was amiss. But it troubled me then, and it troubles me still. At Castle Black, the Queen saw her first wildlings. A raiding party had been taken not long before trying to scale the wall, and a dozen ragged survivors of the fight had been confined in cages for her inspection. When Her Grace asked what was to be done with them, she was told that they will have their ears cut off before being turned loose north of the wall. All but those three, her escort said, pointing out three prisoners who had already lost their ears. We'll take the heads of those three, 
They've been caught once already. If the others were wise, he told the queen, they would take the loss of their ears as a lesson and keep to their side of the wall. Most don't, though, he added. Three of the brothers had been singers before taking the black, and they took turns playing for her grace at night, regaling her with ballads, war songs, and body barracks tunes. Lord Commander Burley himself took the queen into the haunted forest, with a hundred rangers riding escorts, when Alisane expressed the wish to see some of the other forts along the wall, the first ranger, Benton Glover, led her west, atop the wall, past Snowgate, to the night fort, where they had made their descent and spent the night. The ride, the queen decided, was a breathtaking journey as she had ever experienced. As exhilarating as it was cold, though the wind up there blows so strongly, I feared it was about to sweep us off the wall. The night fort itself she found grim and sinister. It is so huge, the men seem dwarfed by it, like mice in a ruined hall, she told Jaehaerys. And there is a darkness there, a taste in the air. I was so glad to leave that place. It must not be thought that the Queen's days and nights at Castle Black were entirely taken up with such idle pursuits. She was here for the Iron Throne, she reminded Lord Burley, and many an afternoon was spent with him and his officers discussing the wildlings, the walls, and the needs of the Watch. Above all else, a queen must know how to listen, Alisane Targaryen oft said. At Castle Black, she proved those words. She listened, she heard, and she won the eternal devotion of the men of the Night's Watch by her actions. She understood the need for a castle between Snowgate and Icemark, she told Lord Burley. But the Night Fort was crumbling, overlarge, and surely ruinous to heat. The Watch should abandon it, she said, and build a smaller castle farther to the east. Lord Burley could not disagree. But the Night's Watch lacked the coin to build new castles, he said. Alisane had anticipated that objection. She would pay for the castle herself, she told the Lord Commander, and pledged her jewels to cover the cost. I have many good jewels, she said. It would take eight years to raise the new castle, which would bear the name of Deep Lake. Outside its main hall, a statue of Alisane Targaryen stands to this very day. The Night Fort was abandoned even before Deep Lake was completed, as the Queen had wished. Lord Commander Burley also renamed Snowgate Castle in her honor as Queensgate. Queen Alisane also wished to listen to the women of the North. When Lord Burley explained that there were no women on the wall, she persisted, until finally, with great reluctance, he had her escorted to a village south of the wall that the Black Brothers called Mole's Town. She would find women there, his lordship said, though most of them would be harlots. The men of the Night's nice Watch took no wives, he explained, but they remained men all the same, and some felt certain needs. Queen Alisane said that she did not care, and so it came to pass that she held her woman's court amongst the whores and strumpets of Molestown, and there heard certain tales that would change the Seven Kingdoms forever. Back in King's Landing, the Archon of Tyrosh, Prince of Pentos, and Jaehaerys I Targaryen of Westeros finally put their seals to a treaty of eternal peace. That a pact was reached at all was considered somewhat of a miracle, and largely due to the king's veiled hint that Westeros itself might enter the war if an accord was not reached. The aftermath would prove even less successful than the negotiations. On his return to Tyrosh, the Archon was heard to say that King's Landing was a reeking sore, not fit to be called a city. Whilst the Magisters of Pentos were so unhappy with the terms that they sacrificed their prince to their queer gods, as is the custom of that city. Only then was King Jaehaerys free to fly north with Vermithor. He and the Queen reunited at Winterfell after half a year apart. The King's time at Winterfell began on an ominous note. Upon his arrival, Alaric Stark led his grace down to the crypts below the castle to show him his brother's tomb. Walton lies down here in darkness, in no small part thanks to you. Stars and swords, the leaving of your seven gods, what are they to us? And yet you sent them to the wall in their hundreds and their thousands. So many, the Night's Watch was hard-pressed to feed them. And when the worst of them rose up, the Oathbreakers you had sent us. It cost my brother's life to put them down. A grievous price. The king agreed. But that was never our intent. You have my regrets, my lord, and my gratitude. 
or would sooner have my brother, Lord Alaric answered darkly. Lord Stark and King Jaehaerys would never be fast friends. The shade of Walton Stark remained between them to the end. It was only through Queen Alysanne's good offices that they ever found accord. The Queen had visited Brandon's gift, the land south of the wall that Brandon the Builder had granted to the Watch for their support and sustenance. It is not enough, she told the King. The soil is thin and stony, the hills unpopulated, the Watch lacks for coin, and when winter comes, they will lack for food as well. The answer she proposed was a new gift, a further strip of land south of Brandon's gift. The notion did not please Lord Alaric. Though a strong friend to the Night's Watch, he knew that the lords who presently held the lands in question would object to them being given away without their leave. I have no doubt that you can persuade them, Lord Alaric, the Queen said. And finally so, it came to pass that the size of the gift was doubled with a stroke. Little more be need said of the time Queen Alysanne and King Jaehaerys spent in the north, after lingering in Winterfell. For another fortnight, they made their way to Torren Square and thence to Barrow Town, where Lord Dustin showed them the barrow of the first king and staged somewhat of a tourney in their honor, though it was a poor thing compared to the tourneys of the south. From there, Vermithor and Silverwing bore Jaehaerys and Alysanne back again to King's Landing. The men and women of their retinue had a more arduous journey home, traveling over land from Barrowtown, back to White Harbor, and taking ship from there. Even before the others reached White Harbor, King Jaehaerys had called together his council in the Red Keep to consider an entreaty from his queen. When Septon Barth, Grand Maester Benefier, and the others had assembled, Alysanne told them of her visit to the Wall, and the day that she had spent with the whores and fallen women of Mole's town. There was a girl there, the queen said, no older than I am, as I sit before you now, a pretty girl, but not, I think, as pretty as she was. Her father was a blacksmith, and when she was a maid of fourteen years, he gave her hand in marriage to his apprentice. She was fond of the boy, and he of her, so the two of them were duly wed. But scarcely had they said their vows than their lord came down upon the wedding with his men-at-arms to claim his right of her first night. He carried her off to his tower and enjoyed her, and the next morning his men returned her to her husband. But her maidenhead was gone, together with whatever love the apprentice boy had borne her. He could not raise his hand against the lord for peril of his life, so instead he raised it against his wife. When it became plain that she was carrying the lord's child, he beat it out of her. From that day on, he never called her anything but whore until finally the girl decided that if she must be called a whore, she would live as one, and made her way to Molestown. There she dwells until this day, a sad child, ruined. But all the while, in other villages, other maids are being wed, and other lords are claiming their first night. Hers was the worst story, but not the only one. At White Harbor, at Molestown, at Barrowtown, other women spoke of their first nights as well. I never knew my lords. Oh, I knew of the tradition. Even on Dragonstone there are stories of men of mine own house, Targaryens who have made free with the wives of fisherfolk and serving men, and sired children on them. Dragon seeds, they call them, Jaehaerys said with obvious reluctance. It is not a thing to boast of, but it has happened, mayhaps more often than we would care to admit. Such children are cherished, though. Oris Baratheon himself was a dragon seed. A bastard brother to our grandsire. Whether he was conceived of a first night I cannot say, but Lord Arion was his father. That was well known. Gifts were given. Gifts? The queen said in a voice sharp with derision. I see no honor in any of this. I knew such things happened hundreds of years ago, I confess it, but I never dreamed that the custom endured so strongly to this day. Mayhaps I do not want to know. I closed my eyes, but that poor girl in Molestown opened them. The right of the first night. Your grace, my lords, it is time we put an end to this, I beg you. A silence fell after the queen had finished speaking, Grand Maester Benefier tells us. The lords of the small council shifted awkwardly in their seats and exchanged glances, until finally the king himself spoke up, sympathetic but reluctant. What the queen proposed would be difficult, Jaehaerys said. Lords grew troublesome when kings began taking things that they regarded as their own. Their lands, their gold, their rights, 
their wives? Alisane finished. I remember our wedding, my lord. If you had been a blacksmith, and me a washerwoman, and some lord had come to claim me and take my maidenhead the day we took our vows, what would you have done? Killed him, Jairus said. But I am not a blacksmith. If, I said. The queen persisted. A blacksmith is still a man, is he not? What man but a coward would stand by meekly whilst another man has his way with his wife? We do not want blacksmiths killing lords, surely. She turned to Grandmaster Benefir and said, I know how Garon Coharis died, Gargon the Guest. How many more such instances have there been, I wonder? More than I would care to say, Benefir allowed. They are not oft spoken of, for fear that other men might do the same. But... The first night is an offense to the king's peace, the queen concluded. An offense against not only the maid, but her husband as well. And the wife of the lord, never forget. What do those highborn ladies do whilst their lords are out deflowering maidens? Do they sew, sing, pray? Were it me, I might pray my lord husband fell off his horse and broke his neck coming home. King Jaehaerys smiled at that, but it was plain that he was becoming increasingly uncomfortable. The right of the first knight is an ancient one, he argued, though with no great passion, as much a part of lordship as the right of pit and gallows. It is rarely used south of the neck, I am told, but its continued existence is a lordly prerogative that some of my more truculent subjects would be loath to surrender. You are not wrong, my love. But sometimes, it is best to let a sleeping dragon lie. We are the sleeping dragons, the queen threw back. These lords who love their first knights are dogs. Why must they slake their lust on maidens who have only just pledged their love to other men? Have they no wives of their own? Are there no whores in their domain? Have they lost the use of their hands? The Justicar Lord Alban Massey spoke up then, saying, There is more to the first knight than lust, your grace. The practice is an ancient one, older than the Andals, older than the Faith. It goes back to the Dawn Age, I do not doubt. The first men were a savage race, and like the wildlings beyond the wall, they followed only strength. Their lords and kings were warriors, mighty men and heroes, and they wanted their sons to be the same. If a warlord chose to bestow his seed upon some maid on her wedding night, it was seen as a sort of blessing. And if a child should come from the coupling, so much the better. The husband could then claim honor of raising a hero's son as his own. Mayhaps it was so ten thousand years ago, the queen replied. But the lords claiming the first knight now are no heroes. You have not heard the women speak of them. I have. Old men, fat men, cruel men, poxy boys, rapers, droolers, men covered with scabs, with scars, with boils, lords who have not washed in half a year, men with greasy hair and lice. These are your mighty men. I listened to the girls, and none of them felt blessed. The Andals never practiced the first night in Andals, Grand Maester Benefir said. When they came to Westeros and swept away the kingdoms of the first men, they found the tradition in place and chose to let it remain, just as they did the godswoods. Septim Barth spoke then, turning to the king. Sire, if I may be so bold, I believe her grace has the right of this. The first men might have found some purpose in this rite, but the first men fought with bronze swords and fed their wirewoods trees with blood. We are not these men, and it is past time we put an end to this evil. It stands against every ideal of chivalry. Our knights swear to protect the innocence of maidens, save for when the lords they serve wish to despoil one, it would seem. We swear our marriage vows before the father and the mother, promising fidelity until the stranger comes to part us. And nowhere in the seven-pointed star does it say that those promises do not apply to lords. You are not wrong, your grace. Some lords will surely grumble at this, especially in the north. But all the maids will thank us for it, and all the husbands, and the fathers, and their mothers, just as the queen has said. I know the faithful will be pleased. His High Holiness will let his voice be heard. Never doubt it. When Barth had finished speaking, Jaehaerys Targaryen threw up his hands. I know when I am beaten. Very well, let it be done. And so it came to pass that the second of what the small folk named Queen Alysanne's Laws was enacted. The abolition of the Lord Ancient's right to the first knight. Henceforth, it was decreed, a bride's maidenhead would belong only to her husband. 
whether joined before a septum or a heart tree, and any man, be he lord or peasant, who took her on her wedding night or any other night would be guilty of the crime of rape. As the 58th year after Egon's conquest drew to a close, King Jaehaerys celebrated the 10th anniversary of his coronation at the Starry Sept of Old Town. The callow boy that the High Septum had crowned that day was long gone. His place had been taken by a man of four and twenty, who was every inch a king. The wispy beard and mustache that his grace had cultivated early in his reign had become a handsome golden beard, shot through with silver. His unshorn hair he wore in a thick braid that fell almost to his waist. Tall and handsome, Jaehaerys moved with an easy grace, be it on the dance floor or in the training yard. His smile, it was said, could warm the heart of any maiden in the Seven Kingdoms. His frown could make a man's blood run cold. In his sister, he had a queen even more beloved than he was. Good Queen Alisane, the small folk called her. From Old Town to the Wall, the gods had blessed the two of them with three strong children, two splendid young princes, and a princess who was the darling of the realm. In their decade of rule, they had known grief and horror, betrayal and conflict and the death of loved ones. But they had weathered the storms and survived the tragedies and emerged stronger and better from all they had endured. Their accomplishments were undeniable. The Seven Kingdoms were at peace and more prosperous than they had been in living memory. It was a time for celebration, and celebrate they did, with a tourney at King's Landing on the anniversary of the King's coronation. Princess Daenerys and Prince Aemon and Balon shared the royal box and reveled in the cheers of the crowd. On the field, the highlight of the competition was the brilliance of Sir Ryman Redwine, the youngest son of Lord Manfred Redwine of the Arbor, Jaehaerys' Lord Admiral and Master of Ships. In successive tilts, Sir Ryan unhorsed Ronald Baratheon, Arthur Oakhart, Simon Dondarrion, Harris Hogg, Harry the Ham to the Commons, and two Kingsguard Knights. Lawrence Roxton and Lucamore Strong, when the young gallant trotted up to the royal box and crowned good Queen Alisane as his queen of love and beauty, the commons roared their approval. The leaves in the trees had begun to turn russet and orange and gold, and the ladies of the court wore gowns to match. At the feast that followed at the end of the tourney, Lord Rogar Baratheon appeared with his children, Boromund and Jocelyn, to be warmly embraced by the king and queen. Lords from all over the realm came to join the celebration. Lyman Lannister from Casterly Rock, Daemon Valerian from Driftmark, Prentice Tully from Riverrun, Roderick Aaron from the Vale, even Lords Rowan and Oakhart, whose levies once marched with Septim Moon. Theomore Manderley came down from the north. Alaric Stark did not. But his sons came, and with them, his daughter. Alara, blushing, to take up her new duties as a lady-in-waiting to the queen. The High Septum was too ill to come, but he sent his newest Septa, Hralia, who had been Targaryen, still shy, but smiling. It was said that the queen wept for joy at the sight of her, for in her face and form she saw the very image of her sister, Arya, grown older. It was a time for warm embraces, for smiles, for toasts, and reconciliations, for renewing old friendships and making new ones, for laughter and kisses. It was a good time, a golden autumn, a time of peace and plenty, but winter was coming. So that concludes chapter 10. Between all of the politicking that Jaehaerys has to do, the progress that Alysanne mostly had to handle by herself, and Barth eliminating half of the crown's debt, albeit at the cost of three dragon eggs, so much happened in this chapter. But I think far and above the highlight of this chapter was the return of Arya Targaryen on Beleriand. By far one of the most terrifying passages I've ever actually read. I'm kind of disappointed that I wasn't able to get this chapter out by Halloween. That's how unsettling that whole passage was. But I think that it really sets up a lot of what I like about the Game of Thrones universe. There's so much still unknown left to be discovered, and I think that's kind of the overall theme of this chapter. Especially with Alyssa Farman trying to plot a new course to lands hitherto unheard of, along with Septim Barth theorizing what remains on Valeria, I mean, Valerian had wounds returning, it just gives you enough to get your gears turning, but not enough to the point where you're going to actually have any of the answers satisfied. It, it piques your interest, 
while still leaving so much on the table, and I absolutely love it. In my opinion, it's executed perfectly. I would say it's executed so well that I would actually love to see a short story or even a full-blown book about Valeria after the Doom. Maybe George could set it up in a way that some soldiers or adventurers get stranded on Valeria and their trial to just survive and make their way back. It would be a really good opportunity to give us a little bit more insight on what Valeria is like now, while still being able to leave something on the table and leave some mystery involved. We know George is very good at doing that from the chapter that we just read. I felt like I had to geek out a little bit about that because I really enjoyed this chapter. So far, it's one of my favorites. But I'm also curious to know what you guys think. What are some of the interesting things that you think Valeria could hold after the Doom, and do you think that there would be enough content there for its own story? Go ahead and let me know in the comments section below. Now that I'm done nerding out a little bit, uh, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping for the channel. I know this video came out a bit behind schedule, and I do plan to return to the once a week release schedule that I had set up before, but keep in mind that the next chapter is a big one. It's the biggest up to this point, so I will do my very best to get it out on time, but just keep in mind that it's very long. And going forward, the chapters tend to be either very long or very short. So I will do my best to get the videos out once a week, but if there's a little bit of a lapse, it's just because there is a lot of content to get through. That being said, one of the biggest things that helps keep me motivated to keep getting videos out for you guys is y'all being subscribed to the channel. Now, I was poking around in the analytics, and there's some ridiculous number of people who watch the content but aren't actually subscribed. And considering that this is part 10 of a series, and this video in and of itself is almost two hours long, if you got to the end of this, you've probably been keeping up with the content, and if you're not subscribed, there's really no reason not to be. The more subs that we have, that's going to be just an extra little kick in the rear end to get me keeping the content coming. So if you're not, go ahead and subscribe for me. I really appreciate it. Now, to those of you who are already subscribed, thank you so much. It means the world to me. I put a lot of work into this content, and to see that it's paying off in a way to where you guys want to consistently come back and keep enjoying it, that's just super awesome. So thank you guys so much for that. All that being said, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll be seeing you next week.